Well, I think the one thing that discipline definitely does help you with is it helps you get things done. And when you get things done, when you, you, you actually do things, you, 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 you have more success. If you have more success, and sometimes a, a big part of success is just not being fucking lazy and just doing it. Yeah. Just get, that's like 90% of it is just showing up. Get there and start working. Like, you're not going to feel perfect every day. If I felt, if I only worked out when I felt good, I'd be a fat fuck. Because there's a lot of days I don't want to do it. I mean, it's pretty much the same with everybody that if, that actually gets good at something. That you you get there's got to be those days you push through, and they're they're probably going to be more numerous than the days you don't. And so the benefit of discipline in my eyes has always been that through discipline I get things done. Yeah. I always tell my I always say that I'm like the most lazy disciplined person I know because I don't want to do it. Yeah, but and I always do. One of the big problems is sitting down and doing the work, mm -hmm. and you you got to And Pressfield talks about that in, in the most concise and beautiful way, and he labels it like an enemy. He calls it resistance, mm -hmm. you know, and that you have to sit down, you have to overcome resistance, and that the pro goes to work. And it doesn't matter if you're sick, doesn't matter if you have kids, it doesn't matter what you you're a pro, and you go to work, and that and that just it puts it in your head. That this is what I do. This is what, and you have pride in that. And then when you are in front of that keyboard, and you're you're you got you look down the count, it says I got a fuck a thousand words today. <laughs> I put a thousand words in you, you know, and yeah. you you you're doing the work. Yeah. And out of that work, gems blossom, yeah. little things. But you might have a day where you just write nothing but dog shit. So what? Show up again tomorrow, and tomorrow out of that dog shit, a flower will emerge. You yeah. never know. And that's the only way to develop real. Like to to really develop your potential a hundred percent in anything, whether it's as an author or even as a martial artist. There's a lot of creativity in martial arts. To be a great striker, you have to be creative because you have to you have to develop patterns or execute patterns that are aren't going to be perceived. This idea that life is hard, something you're supposed to shield from them. It's so silly. And, you know, I've had this conversation with my friends because uh, everybody that I know that's interesting had a fucked up life. But <laughs> but now we have kids, and the last thing we want is our kids to have a fucked up life. So we put our kids in these good schools, we live in these nice neighborhoods, everybody eats healthy, and there's no fucking domestic violence, and everybody seems... It's it's so different than all of our lives. And we were talking about it. Me and Brian Callen were actually talking about it. Like, look, we all had fucked up childhoods, and everybody we know had fucked up childhoods. And they're all interesting, but I don't want my kids to be boring, but I also want them to be safe. <laughs> so it's like, how do you, how do you approach that? I mean, I think you get it. Well, this, what I've chosen to do is get my kids involved in martial arts and, 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 uh, and give them the opportunity to pursue difficult things and understanding that through pursuing these difficult things, like in accomplishing stuff, like you, you learn something about yourself. You learn that you have this ability inside of you to overcome. Get obsessed with life improvement. Find things that you enjoy doing that are difficult. Do them and get better at them. Seems so simplistic. It seems like a ridiculous, idealistic point of view, but it's effective. Well, you need some form, some amount of pride and some amount of ego to get good at things in the first place because it's, it's such a count, counterintuitive notion because you have to have a belief in yourself. You have to be able, like when you, when you, first, when you start out at Jiu-Jitsu, you're a white belt. Like, I remember being a white belt and being like, oh my god, I am fucking never going to get good at this. I'm going to suck forever. But to, 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 to look at people who are better than you and know they had to have sucked at one point in time. Okay, there's got to be, there's somewhere along the end of this tunnel, there's got to be a light. I just got to keep going. Yeah. And uh, that no, takes no. ego, and, and right? Ego, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, ego drives you know you to be successful me to be successful ego is what's driving you the problem is when you let ego go too far yeah and you know everything you know everything takes balance I mean, there's a dichotomy in everything every part of you has a dichotomy you know you can get so into the physical aspects of things that you end up like doing a bunch of steroids and going crazy and ruining your health right yeah. that's that's not good right the other end of the spectrum you know you can sit around and play video games and turn into a Bodybuilding is a great example of that because 
when you start lifting weights, you're like, God, I'd like to be stronger. And you start getting a little bit bigger. You're like, oh, look at that. I got a muscle. Woo, this is cool. And then you keep going, and then you keep going. But some guys get so fucking crazy, yeah. they won't stop until they have 22-inch arms. And they want to have thighs that are so big, they have to walk like they're, they've got a barrel in between their <laughs> legs. And, you know, and they, they just can't help it. They just take it to some completely unhealthy place. Yeah, that's, uh, that's rough. Yeah, well, it's, it's just the nature of trying to get good at something. You got to recognize what's good and what is just fucking insane. For some people, especially, they're just experiencing way too much pressure. And that, that pressure, a lot of times, it's just a, an imbalance in perspective. And some of it's imp like uh, I was talking to this mom once. Uh, her daughter uh, does gymnastics with my daughter. And we were talking about um, kids killing themselves where she used to live. She used to live in um, one of the really wealthy tech areas outside of San Francisco. And a bunch of kids that went to school with her daughter that were like 15, 16, were jumping off bridges and shit. Like it was a, a like an epidemic. And they were trying to figure out what the fuck is going on. And th they're literally calling it affluenza. That these affluent kids and their their families are literally worth a billion dollars you know i mean everybody's super rich and they're having this insane pressure in, like before high school and in high school to be in ivy league schools and to get 4.0s and all and they're fucking they're not having any fun and they're not experiencing life and they don't have any hope and their parents are all on fucking pills and they're just killing themselves for some people out there that aren't feeling good Man, if you just fucking struggled more, you get over that struggle, you feel better. It sounds so simplistic, but I'm, I swear by it. I've, yeah. I've felt shitty myself and then forced yeah. myself to work out. And after I get out of there, I'm like, whoa, 100 percent. It's 100 percent guarantee. It's hard for people to break momentum too. momentum that's good momentum or momentum that's bad momentum. When I get uh, like when I get on a good groove or working out all the time, I feel it. Like after I'm done working out, I'm like, yeah, I can't wait to get in there again. I can't wait to work out again. That's the good momentum. But then there's that bad momentum, like you get injured or something like that, and you can't do anything for a couple of weeks, and then to, to try to get that kickstart that motor up yeah. again, it's the it's hard to get momentum. There's a lot of people that are eating shit food, and then by the end of the day, your body's in a crisis. Yep, yep. Your body's just processing all this bullshit. And if you're eating a big, f like, f bullshit lunch filled with nonsense, like, your body's got to process all that stuff. And so at the end of the day, yeah, you're going to lose your willpower. So, like, when 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock rolls around, you're going to be tired. But if you have a healthy lunch and, you know, you're, you're properly fueled and then you also have positive people in your life, everyone's motivated, by the end of the day, you're going to feel good. Whatever the fuck your thing is, just go and do it. Just force yourself to do it. And if you feel like shit because you ate lunch, then your lunch was, you know, filled with bullshit. Well, then, hey, dummy, don't eat shitty lunch tomorrow. Tomorrow, try a nice salad. Yeah. You know, try a salad with some salmon and see how you feel then. You're like, hey, I feel way better today at 6 o'clock. Duh. Yeah. yeah. Now yeah. your decision making will be better. Like, they, people don't understand how significant it is. Like, all these little decisions, they, those are like, the, that's the path for the rest of your existence on Earth. And if you decide to go to fucking Cheetos chocolate chip cookie route, you're, you're, you're just making a shit path. You're carving your fucking path through broken rocks and glass, and it's not the way to go. You know what else doesn't exist in a day-to-day -day life? What, a place where it's okay to be a man. <laughs> it's actually okay to yeah, be a yeah. man. It's okay to have man thoughts. Like, yeah. everybody is so, so toned down and neutered. It's like human resources and, and corporate life has watered down people's natural behavior to the point where people are just dying on the inside, sitting in these fucking cubicles, rotting, yeah. just freaking the fuck out, having all these thoughts they can't entertain, having to pretend to be someone they're, they're not all day long, putting on this bullshit way of talking, this fake way of thinking. Everybody's got to subscribe to whatever fucking ridiculous policies their company wants to enforce. And you're just a robot, and you get out of there, and you just want to scream. It's this fear of discomfort. People have this extreme feeling in their mind uh, when it comes to their associations with exercise. They want to avoid discomfort. They feel like any type of exercise is just like something to be avoided. That's not for me. Fuck that. I don't want to sweat. I don't want to strain. And a lot of times this association that they have is about the beginnings of getting in shape. It's not about once you're actually fit. Because once you're actually fit, exercise is something you look forward to. It's an alleviation of stress. It's, 
it feels great. Like if I can't get a workout in, I'll, I look at my schedule. I go, oh shit, I don't have any time for a workout, which means I'm not going to get that good feeling. And so instead of looking at it like, oh, I've got to go grunt and sweat, I'm thinking I'm not going to feel good. I'm not going to feel relaxed. I'm not going to feel carefree, and I'm not going to feel even appreciative. Like my appreciation of things and. It gets enhanced greatly after exercise. I just feel better. I feel like I can take things in for what they are, rather than you know whatever the, whatever sensory data that I'm getting from any event is just uh, one more distraction that gets in my way. And, and you know that that's a lot of times how I look at things. If I'm overstressed or if I'm working too much, like our bodies, for whatever reason, uh, most people their associations are to avoid anything that's uncomfortable, but. It's so illogical because when you look at comfort and you look at success and progress and the eventual the feelings of accomplishment and of getting past certain hurdles in, in terms of like how you feel about life, a lot of those are connected to discomfort. Like discomfort is your friend. It really is. Like discomfort and uh, and not being happy and content with certain situations in life or certain feelings in life. They're massive. Massive motivators, and they're they're amazing at at facilitating change, and yet our instinct is to avoid those and just sit on the couch and watch some fucking reality show about dudes who make moonshine with our jaw open. Like it's it's bizarre. And for me, at least, when I get when I get like really disciplined and really、um, I get really consistent with my workouts. One of the things that I feel, I almost feel momentum. I feel like there's like a push behind me. Like, all right, we're you know, like after I get out of the gym, I have a really good workout. I'm like, yeah, now I'm doing it. I'm doing it all the time now, and I'm looking forward to the next time. And it makes that resistance much weaker, and it makes my motivation and my discipline much stronger. I think a、totally. lot of it is based on just the consistency. You know, it's one of the things that I talked about recently on the podcast. I said, you know, like blowing something off. It's not just not good, like blowing off、uh, a, an exercise、uh, that you planned, is not just bad for you physically. It's also bad mentally because then that option is now available. The option to fuck off is available, and you did it before, and you're probably going to do it again, and you'll get mediocre results. Not just in that aspect of your life, but maybe in all aspects of your life. Because I think. That option to fuck off when you embrace it—that is a pathway that you might choose when it comes to dealing with conflict in your personal life, dealing with business decisions, dealing with、uh, career decisions, like an uncomfortable decision that you might be、uh, faced with. Where you, maybe you need to make a change as far as like what your, your pathway is in life, but you don't do it. Instead, you fuck off. And that the inclination to fuck off, I think, that gathers momentum as well. The inclination to be disciplined. That comes with momentum too, and I think both things. Like you, did you take a path, like the path of the healthy person or the path of the fuck off? Like this is not like your body is like a race car that you can juice up yourself. Like you can add the fat tires, you can add the improved suspension, you can beef up the horsepower in the engine. You could do all that yourself, or you could just choose to have this shitty body that's always falling apart on you. Because we're essentially ecosystems. You know, and we're we're in charge. This weird consciousness that has all this resistance and has all this inclination towards comfort and fucking off and blowing things off, is what is in charge of making all these things happen that keep this ecosystem healthy. It's almost like if Earth itself had like a shitty manager. You know, if like there was a manager of a natural manager of Earth that was like, oh God, who cares if it rains? Oh God, you know, like let's, let, you know, I'm I'm gonna stop growing things. I don't give a shit anymore. It's all stupid anyway. I mean, it's literally like the the just blow it up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck it. Let's just kill all the life. What? Well, it's all gonna die eventually. I mean, the the sun only lasts seven billion years. And- you see, that is the perspective a lot of people take with aging, where it's、yeah. like. Well, you're gonna die. You're gonna age. You can't stop aging. And it's like, yes, you're right, but that's not the point. The point is to age better. Like that's the point. The point is to increase your health span. You know, and that is we know is possible. Like that can. There's some. There's some of these like centenarians and super centenarians I've seen that are like, in you know, over a hundred years old, and they're like riding bikes and 
racing and it's like yeah they're old they are very old but they're experiencing a very good quality of life yeah and they're experiencing a quality of life that these other people that don't exercise feel they physically feel their own body diminishing and they just feel it's inevitable it's just it is what it is you're wasting your time you're out there running around but no, we're not because this experience right now it's not like no one's under the illusion that you're gonna live forever but you are enhancing the experience that you're currently involved in right now and you are alive right. you are alive you do experience this life but do you experience this life optimally is it is it as enjoyable as it can be and we all know that there's a spectrum for that enjoyability like we've all had times in our life where it's not been so great and then times in our life where everything came together like what a fucking great day woo like make more of those like you can make more of those and right. then the whole thing's better and i think when that whole thing is better it affects everybody you touch everybody that's around you everybody you come in contact with and that in turn i mean it sounds so grandiose but in in turn can affect the entire race of human beings i've always wondered um, if the depression that people see in mass today, there's so much depression that people, uh, I mean, there's a, co it's a common trait. Like it's, it's a common condition. Oh, he suffers from depression. Oh, she suffers from depression. Like, oh, he's got herpes, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a, it's a common thing. I've always wondered, or I've been wondering more and more recently. Um, it really hit me when, have you ever seen, uh, Heinmo's Arctic Adventure? This guy lives in this incredibly remote area of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in uh, the Alaskan interior. And he, he lives in this really small log cabin and he hunts and gathers and that's all he does. And he's very smart. Like he's not a dummy at all. And he's been up there. He lives with his wife and his, he raised children up there and it's really, really there's some dark moments in there because they lived like this from the time like when they had children up there and they lost their two-year-old baby in a fucking canoe like they tipped over in a in a canoe and mm -hmm. lost their kid and it's like it's really intense when they revisit the site and leave flowers and it was like 30 years ago and they had several children since then but this moment is still like this intense moment sure. of loss for them when they lost their baby but this fucking guy is very happy and very very smart and very connected and very articulate and he firmly believes that human beings when we evolved and developed and were hunter-gatherers that there's a set of rewards there's reward systems that are set up inside the human body inside the the, the very being that we embody that don't get met in today's society mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that's causing depression one of the things that's causing this funk that people are in is that we're living our lives many of us at least in these very unfulfilling ways where you're going to this office with artificial light and you're doing something you don't want to do all day long and then you get home and you're tired and on top of that you're eating shit you're eating potato chips and you're drinking soda and your body is just like, what in the fuck is this? We're supposed to be out in the fields. We're supposed to be walking up hills. We're supposed to be looking for animals or gathering vegetables. We're supposed to be doing all these things that our body's designed to do. We're supposed to be in nature. Yeah. And nature is like a medicine. Like it literally is a medicine to you. Like yeah. people, people that go... You don't have to go hunting. You don't have to go fishing. Just go fucking hike, man. Just go hike up to the top of a mountain and look out. You know, there's a reward that you get from that that is intensely, like, soul-filling. Mm -hmm. There's, like, something about, like, when I was in Colorado and there was this, um, this area of Boulder where you drive up one of these roads and there's this area where you could park. And it was this incredible view, man. And these people just park and just go out there and just look. But you get there and you park and you go, Fuck. Because you would see, you, you literally seeing the continental divide. These snow capped mountains in July. Yeah. In July, it's covered with snow. Because those mountains don't give a fuck. Perspective. Oh. You know, just this whole new perspective on it. And I think nature, I think the ease of suffering is always in presentness. You know, when you're in presentness, truly locked in, in presentness, there is no suffering. There can be pain, but no suffering. Suffering isn't is something created by our own minds. And mm -hmm. I think nature is one of the great ways to do this because humans, we, we learn, we take cues from our environment. And nature, as I was saying earlier, is always in the present. 
You know, there's this natural presentness of all the animals, everything around you. Whereas if you get around a bunch of people watching housewives and stressed about this and popping pills, you're going to take on that energy too. And you're going to lose your presentness because of your surroundings. So it's like this ultimate regrounding tool where we get back to, ah, present moment again. Yeah. You know, and that's such a fucking key element to human happiness. And I think the other key element is having something we're, we're fighting for, you know, having a mission. I think we're all forces and that force needs to have an effect, needs to have a reason that it's moving in a certain direction. And I think with all of our needs and all of our needs met, you know, where we don't have to hunt for food, we don't have to acquire everything. Everything's relatively easy and it's all about advancement and all this. We've lost a lot of the basic mission, which was the mission to survive and procreate. You know, so and we haven't replaced it with any other universal mission, which is, I think, one of the the big allures of these things like wars and these things like creating an enemy. Well, at least then you have a mission. And mm. when you have a mission, human beings are happy. You know, like uh, Bertrand Russell talked about he did a book Conquest of Happiness and he had his own fucked up attributes. Every time I bring him up, people talk about his fucked upness. He like, was into phrenology and he might have been a racist, whatever, but he was a good philosopher. <laughs> Smoked constantly. Yeah. But, but anyways, he talked about the happiest person he knew. The happiest person he could find was a groundskeeper on a manor who every day woke up and was at war with the rabbits of the grounds. <laughs> he just declared that the rabbits were the fucking enemy and he would go out with his gun and he would hunt as many as possible and he'd go morning till, till night and he would kill as many rabbits as he could because it was his, the rabbits were the ones eating the hedges and the flowers and whatever. So he basically made the rabbits his enemy and struck out every single day to kill as many rabbits as possible. And that dude, according to Bertrand Russell, was happy as fuck. He had a task. He had a task. He had a purpose. You know, he had a mission. My mission is to destroy the rabbits. I used to have a dog like that. <laughs> yeah? I had a, the happiest dog ever. His name was Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and uh, he was a pit bull that all he lived for was killing lizards. And my <laughs> house, my old house, not the house of it now, but my old house, had this uh, one... Um, it's like uh, on a hill and there's this one wall where these lizards would run up the wall <laughs> And so Frank I would literally let him out in the morning and he would fucking bolt out that door It's like time to go to war <laughs> like and he would run and go look for these lizards And yeah. he would stand there like Eddie Bravo would just watch it and marvel He'd be like fuck man. This dog does this every day. This dog <laughs> does this every day I go this is what he loves to do and he would go there and he would have his paws on the wall And he would, <laughs> and he would go crazy and he would jump up and try to grab a lizard and occasionally he would get one and he'd be like fuck yeah and he would get one they would go looking for another one he would go I mean, it was a pretty big yard so he would go wandering around the yard looking for anything else that fucked up anything else that was slipping and it was yeah. constantly unfortunately twice i had to take him to the hospital because he got bit by rattlesnakes because <laughs> rattlesnakes were slipping too apparently <laughs> <laughs> he killed the rattlesnakes but the rattlesnakes fucked him up yeah. he had like a water balloon growing out of the oh, side Jesus. of his head both yeah. of my dogs i it was in it by the way that's a real problem if you um don't have the money to pay for the serum it's super expensive it was several thousand dollars to treat them for uh, this rattlesnake venom, anti-venom shit. It's like I was like, man, what if I was poor? What if? Uh, yeah, that, that's a whole fucked up system. Like they you, they inject horses with the venom, mm -hmm. and then they like get the antibodies from the yep, horses. It's exactly. Like this archaic system. I think my friend uh, Donald Schultz is working on. Diff He's a big snake handler guy. He's working on ways to innovate around that because it's kind yeah. of like a real backwards system that they have how you get anti-venom well yeah. a horse will survive so let's just fucking sort of put the venom in there and then we'll get yeah. the antibodies from the horse and then you know it's it's a weird it's a weird thing how they do it yeah well that's a real problem with people that are vegans if you're a vegan and you don't use any animal products and you get bit by a rattlesnake you got two choices <laughs> compromise your morals well that's a wrap yeah you know um but this dog was so goddamn happy mm -hmm. he had missions yeah. You know, he would go out of that yard and he wasn't bored. He was like, please take me for a walk. Come on, man. He was like, see you, dude. I'd open that door. He was gone. Yeah. He just had his little mission. And I think you can see that in the people who are the most unhappy. They seem aimless. Yeah. They're like, what am I here for? Why am yeah. I doing this? Nothing makes sense, you know? Yeah. And I've even felt it in my own life when, you know, I know what my mission here is. For My mission is to expand human consciousness, to help people be happy. Like, that's really what I find my greatest purpose in but every once in a while I'll get this kind of like fuck people attitude maybe someone said some fucked up shit and I'm like man people fucking suck fuck people 
And then at that point, that's when I'm actually depressed, yeah. you know, because I've lost my mission. Instead of having a mission like, yes, my mission is human consciousness, all of a sudden it's like, fuck people, fuck that mission. They'll figure it out. And then I'm depressed because I've lost my purpose. It's very hard to rise above, like literally, when something like that happens and realize like, oh, you've just, you're, you're encountering one diseased individual. You've got to yeah, yeah. look at the mass of humanity. Yeah. Like when you encounter one diseased individual, it's, it's so like this guy who shot up that nightclub in Orlando, you're, you're looking at one diseased individual. And if you say, man, people fucking suck, look at what they did. Well, look at how many people that are responding with rainbows on their Twitter pages and love and, and, and all the best wishes to those folks that got killed and all that. I mean, I was looking at this guy's page who's a, uh, an animal lover who was organizing people to go to the homes of the victims and see if they have pets that are trapped. You know, there's, there's beautiful people out there. Yeah. There's no a lot. There's more beautiful people. This... This is without a doubt not just the safest, the easiest. This is the happiest time in terms of like being able to like reach out and 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 send love to people and have people send love to you. But just occasionally you run into cunts. Yeah, no doubt. Know? And the cunts itself, man. But the, the beauty is out there too. It's yeah. just not as dramatic and it doesn't impose upon us as mm -hmm. forcefully. But if we just look. It's around all the time. We run into good people all the time. But you know, you just make eye contact with that good person or that kid who's just looking at you and just creeping yeah. with that little smile and you're like oh yeah the good of humanity the fact that you know we really are love you know being expressed you know outwardly all the time and it's just these other delusions that get in the way of that well we're oddly attracted to negativity too it's almost like we look at negativity online or that you run into as like a possibility of war like you have to look out this fucking drums beating god damn it there's an army on the background they're coming they're coming but you know it's like this this real impulse to sort of batten down the hatches when really it's just some fucking 36 year old loser sitting in his parents basement you know farting and smelling his own farts and angry online i mean that's really what a lot of you're dealing with you're really, you're dealing with like really sick people like people that have just for whatever reason They've not found their path. They've not found any happiness. They've not found any fulfillment. They don't found. They haven't found any growth. They're just stifled or rotten in some sort of a weird way. It just hasn't really worked for them. Yeah. And so they're they're lashing out. They're lashing out at the world. And you run into one of those, and you're like, ah, oh, people suck. Yeah. But, yeah. And that's the initial response. And then the more conscious response is to look at them, be and have compassion for that person. Yeah. You know, that's and, hard and that's, to do, right? That is hard to do. And and our system isn't based upon that. Even if you look at the U.S. penal system, it's very much about punishment. Whereas if you watch that that uh, documentary that Michael Moore did, Who to Invade Nest, where they go to Norway, they have a whole different idea of what the penal system is for. It's about restoring human dignity and cultivating you know a, a change really making change in the person it's mm. not about punishment it's about it's about actually changing that individual so he doesn't do it again and then you look at the recidivism rates between our prisons and norway's prisons and they're just dramatically different that impulse to punish immediately you know is not the healthiest impulse that's right. just going to create more issues down the road you're not rehabilitating anybody you're just taking even more broken people and putting them out in the world and hoping they're not going to do the broken things well, it's not going to fucking work. You know, the, the right impulse is always that compassion and looking to see as if that was you, how all of these fucked up elements of the world and choices. I'm not overriding the fact that they had choices in all this. They're not free of guilt. But look at, look at that like this is the person that just made some bad choices and had some tough shit to deal with and couldn't overcome it. The resistance in the video game was higher than his skill set and he wasn't able to, to choose to work and choose to... The, the positive elements that would allow them to overcome it, you know? Yeah, see it's, that. It's, it's also Norway's dealing with far fewer people. That's true. You know, and that's, that's a good that's thing true. for them. And it's also, they, they don't have that <clears throat> conquerors mentality that we have. So we, we were so wrapped up in success and also in punishment. I mean, that, that is a big aspect of our culture, like punishment and... I mean, like, when anybody does anything wrong online, the amount of people that feel like it's their job to shame that person and embarrass that person and, and insult that person, it's pretty crazy to watch when something goes yeah. down. It's all so, it's all so counterproductive, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I see that in the people shaming people for appropriation, right? So let's say, for example, someone wears a headdress at a fucking 
festival, right? They're probably mildly, they're not doing it to mock the Native Americans, most likely. It's probably like a, a mild appreciation and interest. I think this looks cool. I'm in a place and, you know, and then all of a sudden they get all this intense hate and shame and, and <coughs> putting all of this stuff, all of these intentions on them that weren't true. Again, going back to my point about morality, it's not about the act. It's about the intentions of the act. But right now we make it all about the act. Oh, you wore this headdress. That means you're insulting thousands of years of Native Americans. You're oppressing, you're appropriating. Like, no, I fucking wasn't. I was wearing no. a fucking hair headdress. But then all of a sudden that imprint will create trauma. And that trauma will have a poisonous impact that will make them feel weird and make them want to do that to other people. So it's like you're in injecting someone with a like a hate virus, you know, that they're going to then pass on to other people rather than doing the opposite. You know, spreading the love herpes where yeah. it's this contagious positivity that goes the other way. And we have those choices with how to deal with people. But more often than not, we come with this thing to punish and create more trauma, which triggers their own self-judge and their own self-hate, lowers their own self-love. And then they're going to pass that off to kids, family members, people around them. You know, there's just two sets of dominoes that we can choose to take to take either path.